much for coming. Um, my name is Tomasz Petrzyczek, and I'm talking about uh, a paper called Data Exploration Through Dot-Driven Development. And this is part of a sort of bigger project that tries to make programming with data easier, um, and especially in context of media. So the idea is, um, if you're a journalist and you want to produce something like this, um, how can we make it easier for you to write the code that or to transform the data into the format that lets you build some interesting visualizations. In this example, um, so this is a, a visualization that the New York Times team did that looks at the history of Olympic games. Um, so over time, you get to see what were the countries with the largest number of gold medals or medals overall. Um, and um, it's really nice, it's a really nice piece of work. You can find it on the New York Times. Um, and when you come to it as a programming languages person, you're obviously thinking, well, how can I see what exactly they did? And even in something this simple, there's actually interesting problems because, uh, for example, um, how you count medals for things like football, where there's 13 people getting medal in the end. Do you count it as 13 or do you count it as, as just one? So, that's an example of an interesting decision that they had to make when, when building the visualization. And the idea behind this whole project is, can we do it so that there's some view source button where you can actually easily find how it was done and maybe change it to see the alternative perspective. So here, um, the, the way people like data journalists who build these visualizations work is there's these two options. Um, for most people, it's really mainly Excel and using spreadsheets, but spreadsheets have a number of problems. They're error prone. So there's a famous economics paper where they did off by one error when uh, calculating some sums of columns, and as a result, they got the wrong numbers. Um, it's also not reproducible because when you're working with a spreadsheet, you're actually modifying the data so there's no like reproducible trace of what you've done. But the nice thing is that everyone can use spreadsheets. Um, now with programming, if you have a script that scrapes the data from somewhere, does the transformation, produces the visualization, then it's fully reproducible. Um, and um, every, anyone can run it. It can also be analyzed. So you could imagine having various tools that will look at the sort of scripts behind very various media stories and tell you what are all the data sources for it, doing some program analysis, is it using the units in the right way, and so on. Um, but if you look at even the simplest programming languages like Python, there's actually quite a lot of non-trivial non -trivial problems or non-trivial tasks. So this is an example in, in Python where I want to count, um, I want to sort athletes based on the number of gold medals they got from Rio, uh, from the recent Olympics. And so I read a CSV file. The second line is doing filtering. So this is looking at where the column games is Rio. Um, the input file is just a flat CSV with um, every single medal per line. So here I only get lines where the medal is from Rio. Then I group it by athlete and I aggregate where I sum the number of gold medals. And here you can see another syntactic construct because I had to create a dictionary. And then I sort it by gold and take the first eight. So even in this very, very simple aggregation, very, very simple script, I had to do quite a lot of different things. Um, I had to understand what are dictionaries in Python to construct the aggregation. I had to figure out that the, the sorting, at the, the filtering at the beginning, this is some sort of generalized indexer where uh, it's parameterized by a Boolean and then it does a fancy lookup. Um, you have to remember all the operation names because in sort of dynamic languages like Python, you don't really get very good IntelliSense or autocompletion. Um, you have to know what the column names are in my CSV. So can we make this a bit easier? Um, and that's exactly what we are trying to do with this paper. So I'll show you a quick demo that does the same thing. 
and I'll show it live. So if it goes wrong, we will see. Um, and I've got uh, Olympics as my preloaded data set. And then the nice thing is that when I type dot, it will give me a, an offer of the available transformations. So I wanted to filter data where game is real. And as I'm doing it, I get autocomplete that's offering me all the available options. So this is my filtering. Then I wanted to do grouping by athlete. And here as the next step, this is actually offering me all the, all the possible aggregations that I can do over the, over the data set. So one of those was sum the number of gold medals. And then I can sort the data. And as you can see, this is actually tracking the available columns throughout the, the transformation. So it knows that um, I have my key, which is the athlete and the, the aggregated gold number. So I'll sort it by gold and then take the first eight. Um, and now I'll save this as a variable and I can create a table to sort the data. And if I update the page, then something goes wrong. The thing that goes wrong is that I didn't, at the very end, I'm still in the transformation mode. So I need to say, get the data to actually get all the results as a, as a data table. And then when I run it, I'll get a table with the Olympic medalists from Rio and their number of gold medals. So this was a simple example of um, the, the programming language or the, the system that we've been working on that lets you do data exploration basically just by typing dot and choosing one of the available members. And um, I think this is, there's really interesting space in this um, data exploration. So this is a chart or a, a illustration from a talk by Jonathan Edwards where he's been looking at end user programming of social applications, but I think it's equally applicable in data science where um, if you look at the spectrum of the available tools, um, the height is how many people can use it, and the other axis is how difficult it is. And there's this peak with spreadsheets, which are a lot of people can use it, but it can solve only fairly simple problems. Um, and then programming can solve or is pretty complex and uh, can be used by a very small number of people. And there's this gap in the middle where there's sort of lots of problems that we could solve quite easily, but don't quite fit for spreadsheets and are just too hard for programming. So that's the space I'm trying to fill with this project. And um, I think that the key idea of the paper is that uh, we can actually do quite a lot with this very simple approach of um, providing members of some object and letting people choose which of the members they want. So encoding fairly complex logic by a really simple mechanism of choosing a member of some, of some provided object. Um, and the way it works behind the scenes is that the, the language I was writing is very simple, nominally typed um, and statically typed programming language that has support for type providers. Um, and type providers are a mechanism that lets you generate the, the types of the objects behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, there's some code that generates what will be the available members. And that's just a normal type that the programming language can then use and uh, type check when you access members. One important thing here is that this is done lazily. Um, so if you look at the, at the types that I was working with in the example, uh, there's really quite a lot of members. Um, if you type dot, it will generate the next level and then you can sort of explore further. But if you wanted to generate source code with all those types, um, it would be uh, potentially infinite. So you can't really code gen the whole thing. Um, and the type providers work lazily. So as you look 
through the, as the type checker explores parts of the program, it will evaluate and uh, sort of get precise definitions of the types it needs along the way. The other interesting thing is that uh, this actually lets us um, encode many of the fancy types that people in the programming language community have been working, uh, have been working on um, in a sort of very user-friendly and simple way. And I'll have a concrete example of this shortly. Um, so sp more specifically, the, the part that um, is presented in the paper is this pivot type provider. Um, and um, the idea of type providers um, in, this, in this context is that you define some sort of mapping or, con or type context um, that maps names to definitions and nested, more nested types. So L, you can see it as a, as a function that takes a type name or class name. It gives you the definition of the type, uh, which is some type with some constructors, some members. Um, and then it gives you some more types that might have been generated along the way. Um, and then the, the pivot, the concrete type provider, like the one that lets me do this aggregation and so on, um, can be parameterized by something like a schema of the CSV file, which was the case in this example. And then it gives me the, the top level type, the top level class, together with all these nested contexts that the type checker can then explore as needed. So a concrete example, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, but a concrete example is the top level class. So when I typed Olympics dot, it came with these, these um, and a few more options. Um, and so the way this is constructed is that I'm really just defining uh, a function that when I give it the names of the available columns in the CSV file, it will generate type where um, some of the members or all of the members in this case return some other type that's generated by some other function that sort of looks specifically at the available, available fields or columns in the data source and based on this, it will generate type uh, specifically for, for CSV files with this structure um, that lets you do the transformations, sorting, and so on. So this is the mechanism behind the scenes that's generating the type um, as, you're, as you're writing the code. And um, I think at this point, I'd like to just go back to this a little bit and say a few more things about how this works. So I'll start from scratch. And um, the interesting thing here is if you look at the Olympics data set, then one of the operations here is drop columns. And um, this is a very straightforward one where it just goes through all the available columns in the CSV file and it generates drop and that name for every single one. Um, and the nice thing here is that this is actually, or you can see it as encoding fairly complicated logic uh, or fairly complicated type system mechanism. So here, if I say drop discipline and I say drop, uh, sp let's drop, I don't know, sport, let's drop event, let's drop games. As I'm doing it, the, the, the columns I dropped are actually disappearing from the list. And um, that's because of the way the, the um, types are generated, but uh, it's also, you can see it as encoding of um, various work on row types in the type theory world. So um, if you were doing this in some other programming language, you could say, well, Let's just encode this dropping or the type of typing operation of this dropping using row types. So here the rule is saying if I have an expression E which has a type that contains F1 to Fn fields and n different fields with n different types. And if I write drop Fi, then I'll end up with a type that contains um, all the fields except for the Fi field. And this is what some 
uh, programming languages with more powerful type systems let you do. Um, and the way we can do something that's very much similar without a very complex type system is that we can say, if I have um, expression E with type C1, um, then E drop FI is going to have type C2, and drop FI is just the regular member of the, the object. Um, and then on the side, I can keep some relation, which is what the paper uses, um, behind the types and the fields that actually exist in the type. So this, is, um, this ends up encoding very similar principles, very sim similar structures, but rather than using very fancy type system, we can do this with just simple nominal typing and members. And um, this is really nice idea. Um, and in this paper, we do this with, or we encode um, things that you could otherwise track with row types and phantom types. There's some other work that uh, people have been doing on encoding session types using type providers. And I think there's potential for adding a lot more other um, interesting things, uh, or interesting work that has been done on type systems, um, encoding it in this very simple user-friendly way. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show so this is going sort of uh, further than just looking at the type systems and the, the type theory in, or the, the um, formalization of how the type providers work. Um, because what I said earlier was this sort of mismatch between spreadsheets and, and uh, programming languages. So here, the idea was now that we've simplified the language, um, to just do dots and so on, can we actually sort of take the next step and make it a bit more like working with spreadsheets? Um, and so this is the same code I was showing before, but now it's running with uh, another feature turned on, which lets me, whenever I click somewhere in the, in the, um, in the code, it generates a preview so if I go here and say, uh, let me do dropping again, I can drop columns. So if I don't care about the event, I'll drop it. And now you can see in my table, event isn't there. Um, I could drop something else. So let's drop, let's also drop discipline. And if you look at the preview again, um, you can sort of explore the data as it looked at different stages. Um, so, let me load this again. The other interesting thing, so here, if we say filter by Rio, and then group data and do sum, um, the editor tries to go a bit sort of further than just giving you a preview. So what I can do as well is uh, based on the available members, um, we've we, we are automatically providing the UI that lets you add uh, the different members. So at this point, when I'm in a group by and I um, group the data by athlete and I sum the number of gold medals, maybe I also want to count all the different medals so I'm going to do that. And now you can see the number of gold medals and also the new column. And I can go to sorting. And rather than sorting it by the number of gold medals, I can change it and uh, sort the data by the number of all medals. And then if I go back to my preview, this it will be this will be showing the number of all the, all the medals. So the idea here is um, sort of to explore where, where you can go um, if you wanted to bridge the, the spreadsheet world and the uh, programming languages world. And um, the editor that I was showing here um, relies quite heavily on the very simple structure of the program. So, um, as it, 
as it generates the editor, it will just look at all the members that um, have been generated or used along the way. Um, all the sort of add a new operation is again looking at the available members of the provided type and so on. So this is all I wanted to show. Um, I think the summary of the talk, there's really three interesting things. Um, one is that um, I think, especially in programming tools for data science, there's really sort of interesting space between the very simple and not reproducible and error-prone spreadsheets and the programming languages that are really hard to use for uh, many, many people who would otherwise be interested in exploring data. Um, the key contribution of the, of the paper is that um, if you take this dot-driven, as we call it, uh, dot-driven approach, you can actually express quite a lot of non-trivial uh, operations such as aggregation, sorting, transformations using a programming language that pretty much has just the member access. And this is also an interesting way of encoding work that's been done in more uh, fancy type systems into a language that's really, really simple. And if you have any questions, there's contact details here. You can learn more about the work at dgamma.net, which uh, has, the, has the editor that I was showing, so you can play with it, and the paper is available on my website. Thank you. <laughs>